Good morning. Welcome to Legacy. Boy, did everybody go on vacation? All right. So we'll start with the top by numbers, right, today? Sometimes at night I am afraid I cover my eyes I cover my shame So here in the dark Broken apart Come with your light And fill up my excited to do this next song for you. Um, I'll give Robin and Marty and the guys all the credit. They did all the work on it, but it's a beautiful song, and it talks about how we're supposed to give, how God wants all of us. He don't want us just on Sunday. He wants us every day, and so I hope you all enjoy it. You won't relent until you have it.
The next song um, talks about the goodness of God, and it's actually being one of my favorite songs because God is always good. He's good with us in the fire. He's good with us on the mountain. He's always there. He's always good, and he's been with me every day of my life. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Cause all my life you have been faithful. And all my the goodness of God. Listen to this voice. I love your voice. As you have led me through the fire in the darkest nights. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness. I thank you for grace. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Even when we make mistakes, God, even when we find ourselves in sinful situations, I thank you that there is nothing that we can do that can stop your love. And I pray, God, that we would do nothing to stop your grace. 
Lord, your grace is the most powerful thing this world has ever experienced. And my prayer is that people that don't know you as Savior, God would allow you to become that in their lives. Lord, I pray we have uh, many, many um, church family members who are traveling and on vacation. I pray that you would give them a great time, that you would just help them to, uh, to, to be safe and to enjoy themselves. I pray for your presence in this service, God, that as we open the word of God, that we would also open our hearts and our minds to your will for us. Lord, I just ask you for your leadership and have your way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You guys can be seated. Um, if you will, you'll notice uh, on the seat either under you or beside of you, there are some sermon notes for those of you that are interested in that. You can grab that and just kind of uh, follow along there. I did have him to leave uh, some blanks just so you can take your own notes there. I want to talk to you today about myths, about myths. Um, myths are things that are wildly held but not true. So I'm going to give you a couple and uh, you can admit it if you want to. I'm sure some of you may, may hear some of these and think, oh, I thought that was true. And uh, actually it is a myth. First, lightning never strikes the same place twice. Have you ever heard that? Lightning, not true. Something also not true. The mustard seed is the smallest seed. Did you think the mustard seed? You don't have to answer out loud. We think the mustard seed is the smallest seed. Actually, does anybody know what it is? An orchid. I didn't know that. It's a big flower. I figured it would be a big seed. Not the case. Um, here's one. Dogs' mouths are cleaner than humans. Huh? That is definitely a myth. Do you see what those things lick? It is a myth. It is not true. I'm not ripping on dogs. I'm just saying not the case. Since we're talking about things being uh, myths, five-second rule. It is a myth. You cannot drop food on the floor and it be clean for five seconds. Guys, it is a myth. Now, depending on how good the food is, it might be worth the risk. I'm just saying. I don't know about that. Bulls hate red. That's a myth. It's actually not the color. Now, here's what I'm curious about. Scientifically, they've proven that bulls are colorblind. How can they tell you that? I'm just wondering. Apparently, it's just the movement of the thing when they have the little guys do that. Um, bats are blind. It's a myth. That's a myth. Um, this is another one. Make sure no parents get upset at this. It takes seven years to digest chewing gum. It's a myth. Actually, there are certain things in gum that are never going to digest. It just is, it is the way it is. So there you go. So I've been praying about how to wrap up this, this battle plan 2020. And, and I just felt like that there are certain myths that we have, even as followers of Christ, as we're facing these spiritual battles, as we're going into these things, there's these certain myths that we hold and we've held for a long time. But as we study them and as we compare them to the truth of God's word, we figure out that they are not true. So today what we're going to do is we're going to bust some myths. We're going to bust some myths. So I'm going to start and I'm going to share with you in Psalm 118 verse 6. And actually we're going to share two verses here to start. And it will, uh, it will lead us to our first myth. Psalm 118 verse 6 says this. The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Let me read it one more time. The Lord is for me, so I will not fear. What can mere people do to me? And there's two things in that, and we've always put those two things together, and they don't necessarily equate to what you think they do. And it becomes a myth, and unfortunately it's a myth that the enemy uses to keep us in a place that he doesn't have to worry about us as much. The second verse that I want to share pertaining to the first myth is Romans chapter 8, verse 31. If God is for us, who can ever be against us? So here are the myths. We, we, these verses are absolutely true. However, I think sometimes when we read part of that verse, we assume that it affects the second part of that verse in a certain way 
So here are the myths that we're going to bust. Myth number one, and it's a dual myth. The first part is, people can't do anything to me. We read there, the Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? So if the Lord is for me, people cannot do anything to me. And the truth is, that is a myth. I know you're in church, but can, can you be honest and just say amen or shake your head? And we're going to get to why this becomes scary here in a second. The second part is that no one or no thing is against me. Because if God is for me, who could possibly be against me? So if God is for me, then nothing can be against me. And guys, these are myths. So we have to answer the question. Do we have to answer several questions? Number one, what can people do to me? And secondly, who is against us? So that's the myth that people can do nothing to me and no one or nothing is against me. Here's the problem. When people are mean and when they're jerks and when they hurt you, we feel unprepared for battle. And more important, when people are mean to us and they hurt people that we love, oftentimes that's harder to deal with. Amen? When you hurt somebody that I love, when you hurt a family member, when you hurt a friend, that's oftentimes harder to deal with than when somebody hurts me. And here's the problem. If I think that these myths are true, if I think that people can't do anything to me and then people hurt me and they, they really just affect me in a negative way, then I'm unprepared for the fight. This is so important that you get this. If we feel, okay, God in his word says that people can't do anything to me, if we assume that, which by the way, is not what that, that's not what that verse said. What it said is that if God is for me, I will not fear, and what can mere man do to me? It did not say man cannot do anything to me. What did it do? He is asking the question, what can man do to me? Now, who wrote most of Psalms? David. Did, did man cause him some hardships? Did you read some dark, dark, dark psalms in there? I'm talking like, Lord, kill them. Take them out, kill their children, kill their dogs, wipe them from the... I'm talking, he was in a dark place sometimes. And then he would turn around and write this beautiful picture of love between him and God. People were mean to him. Here's the scary part. Please get this. If we buy into those myths that people can't do anything to me and that no one or no thing is against me and then we feel as if the world is against us, we're facing all this stuff, then we start to believe that God's word is not true. That's a scary place to be. That is a very, very, very scary place to be. So let's bust the myth. You ready? It's time to bust the myth. First of all, Anything that is ungodly in its nature or thinking is against you. Understand this. Anything that is ungodly in its thinking or in its nature is against you. And here's the truth. We by nature are children of wrath. It says in King James, we are children of destruction by nature. I'll talk about that a little bit later, about our sinful nature. But the truth is not everything around us is godly. Now the good news is that God is for us, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. But if we are unprepared to realize that things are against us, there are, there are the Bible tells us in Ephesians when we're talking about that people are not our enemies, okay? Please understand that. People are not our enemies. But spiritual wickedness in three particular places, in the spiritual realm, on this dark world, and in the eternal or in the heavens. These are spiritual things, and all of those are against you. Do you realize that? That the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your hope. He wants to kill your spirit. He wants to destroy your witness. He wants to destroy your eternity. He wants to destroy your anointing. You have things against you. I'm going to just be real with you. A lot of unbelievers are against you. And not because they're jerks necessarily, but they're against you because your walk of faith makes them sometimes feel guilty. When you really have a change in your life, and God has really come in and radically transformed you, 
if, if you really walk that walk of faith, then God must be real. And if God is real, then I'm going to have to answer to him one day. And if I've got to answer to him one day, then maybe I've got to change some things. People who don't believe in God are against you sometimes, not because they don't like you, but because it makes them feel guilty. You see, the enemy wants you to think that no one's against you, no thing is against you, and that people can't do anything to you so that when all of those things happen, you're unprepared and you feel like God lied to you. Now, here's my question. Does God say in his word anywhere that people can do nothing to you? It doesn't say that anywhere. We assume that, right? Because it, the first part of that is good and it's positive that God is for us. So what I want you to do is I want us to this on this first myth to realize several things. Number one, people can hurt you. Amen? And, and people can in different ways, and, and I, won't, I won't get into that, but I mean we can just be realists here and, and realize that people can do things to hurt you. Do you ever feel like spiritually when you're trying to take a next step, it just seems like every stinking thing in the world comes against you. Anybody? I mean, I mean, you're ready to take the next step. You're ready to say yes to the calling. You're ready to say yes, and I'm going to do more. I'm going to start to serve, and it just feels like attack after attack after attack, right? And if we buy into these myths, then we think, well, God lied to me in his word. So we have to bust that myth. Now, here's the good news. First of all, you need to be prepared for those battles, but, this, but I want to go back to really what started both of those verses, and that is that the good news is that the Lord is for you. Amen? This is good news. Yes, you have an enemy, and he's trying to kill you and, and to steal your joy and to destroy you, and yes, sinful nature in people, it's trying to, it's trying to cause chaos. By the way, that's something else that we face, and that sinful nature is not just in other people, but it's in us. It's our sinful nature. We're selfish in nature. And it's not because we're bad people. It just is our nature. But the good news is, is that God is for you. Now, I want to just share with you several titles that God has. All of these, all of these are based in Scripture. So when you feel this attack, when you feel like that the enemy is coming after you, I want you to remember who is for you, who is on your side. The maker of heaven and earth is for you. The king of glory is for you. The most high is for you. The prince of peace is for you. The promise keeper is for you. The healer is for you. The forgiver is for you. The protector is for you. The everlasting God is for you. The redeemer of all mankind is for you. The comforter is for you. The all-sufficient one is for you. The righteous judge is for you. The good shepherd is for you. The great I am is for you. And your Abba, Father, Daddy is for you. This is good news. In the midst of being attacked and being attacked and having enemies come at me, spiritual battles that I'm facing all the time, yes, I need to realize that they're real. Yes, I need to be prepared for the battle. But thank God I know who is for me. You see, God is the author and the finisher of our faith. And he is for you. One of the things that I have prayed through this series, I just feel, I have just felt like that Christian people are so unprepared for this spiritual battle that God wanted us to prepare for the spiritual battle. By the way, when this thing started, I don't, I don't remember exactly when it was, but I don't think we were dealing with some of the issues that we're having now in our society and, and through this sickness and arguing and fights over race and all these other things. And I'm telling you, it is a battle. And if you're not prepared and if you just stand around with your hands in your pockets, you're going to take a thumping. You're going to get hurt. Let's move on here. Let's move on here to myth number two. I want to, I'm going to share with you some scripture first. I'm going to be in Exodus chapter 14. I'm going to read Exodus 14 verses 10 through 14. And then we're going to break this down and I'm getting ready to have to own my junk. You guys have heard me talk about that, right? When you mess up to own your junk and I'm getting ready to have to apologize actually uh, to an entire church. Not this one necessarily, uh, but, but another church. I'm getting ready to have to own my junk and apologize. I'm going to read to you Exodus Chapter 14, verses 10 through 14. 
Y'all ready for God to open your eyes to something pretty big that you've probably never seen before? All right. Exodus chapter 14, verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, Why did you bring us here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? <clears throat> what have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you this would happen while we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone. Let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. You see here, the Israelites, they're under attack and they're panicking and they're complaining and they're questioning their leaders and they just prefer to go back to the way things used to be. Does this relate to our situation in our society right now? Let me go back to what the Israelites are doing. They're under attack. Check. Yes? We're under attack. There's panic among the people. Check. They're complaining. Check. Exclamation point. Star thing. Yes. They're questioning their leaders. Check. And by the way, this is true on every level, on a local level, on a state level, on a national level, even within churches. I mean, I get to talk to pastors and guys, listen, it feels as if there's a no-win situation. And I get that and I knew that going into this, that we have people that think different. And you know what? That's fine. But, there's, but it feels like that there's all this, there's, there, there's no way to win. And I don't, I'm glad I'm not in politics. I have no calling on my life to be in politics. But the truth is, really, there's no way for them to win. Because no matter what they choose, somebody's going to fuss at them on this side. And somebody's going to fuss at them on that side. And so this is what's going on, right? So we can check that off. And all they want to do, all the Israelites wanted to do was to just go back to where they were. And do things the way that they used to do things. You see, I think God uses this to relate to us. Yes, it was written thousands and thousands of years ago. Exodus was. But you see, God's word is alive. And it has the ability to come off of the page and to, and to penetrate our hearts and our lives and to relate to us in a very real and in a very personal way. So then that brings us to verse number 13. But Moses told the people... Don't be afraid, just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will fight for you, just stay calm. Myth number two, this is powerful. This was getting out of bed for, I'm telling you right now, even though I'm preaching it, this was worth getting out of bed for, this was worth you listening and sitting down for just a minute. Myth number two. God wants us to stand still and watch when under attack. Man, I pray the Holy Spirit just penetrates your heart with this. Myth, myth, long held as true, however, it's untrue. And here's the myth. The myth is that God wants you to stand still and watch when you're under attack. Unfortunately, this has been taught to us for a long period of time. Unfortunately, this has been preached to us for a long period of time. And I told you I'm going to own my junk. To my knowledge, I have never preached from this stage in this church that you need to just stand still and watch the salvation of the Lord. However, I have taught and I have preached that at, at the previous church. And I still have family members, church family members that I love there at Cornerstone. And I know that I've preached that there. And as I was studying this week, I just felt so convicted. And so sometimes some of them tune in and watch. And maybe you're watching or maybe you're going to watch later. Not live, but watch later. If that's you, I apologize. I feel like I am so convicted because I've taught that before and I've bought into this. And the truth is it is a terrible, 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 terrible myth. It is not true. But here is what Christians, we've bought into this. We've been taught that so long. We've been preached to this so long that we've started to believe that. And here's what we believe. We believe that it makes sense. And we'll even take comfort in that. That if you're tired, just stand still. If you're under attack, stand still. That if you get to where you're feeling overwhelmed by the enemy, just stand still and watch. 
somebody else or watch God go to work. And friend, I'm telling you, that is a lie straight from the pits of hell. God did not say that. Now, whoa, 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 wait a minute, Pastor. We, you just read the scripture. You just read the scripture right there that... Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Just stand still. Stand still and watch. Stand still and watch. It's right there in the scripture. Yes, it is. Here's what I want you to notice, and we're going to bust this myth. And I'm telling you, this is one that I pray, I pray, I pray you guys get. And I, my prayer all week has been that this thing would just penetrate you and that you would see this verse of Scripture, these couple of verses of Scripture, different than you ever have before. Here's what I want you to notice, verse 13. Who said, stand still and watch the Lord? Who said that? Moses. Moses said, after the people complained, after the people questioned him, after the people are ripping his hind end, Moses said to the people who are complaining about him, who are, who are teeing off on him, Moses said to them, stand still and watch. Here's what I want you to notice, verse 15. Verse 15, then, say then, then the Lord said, who said? Who said? Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the people to get moving. Whoa, 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 whoa. In the midst of complaining, in the midst of feeling overwhelmed, man says stand still. Man said just to watch somebody else do something. But God says, get moving. God said, you leave this place and you go to that place. And here's what the enemy has had all of us as Christians to believe. And I apologize to my Cornerstone family. I apologize if I've ever let that be thought of here. God never said to stand still in the midst of a battle. God never, ever, ever said that. As a matter of fact, when man said that, cave to the opinion of the people, when man said that, God said, what are you doing? Get moving. Here's what I want you to think. Had they stood still, had they done what Moses wanted them to do, what side of the Red Sea would they have stayed on? What would have happened? Pharaoh and the Egyptian army would have came and they'd have taken all their valuables. Listen to what happens when we stand still. Take all your valuables. They'd have made you slaves again after experiencing freedom. They'd have separated and divided the family. And if they saw you as no good, they would have killed you because it's easier to kill you than to feed you. Had they followed the opinion of man, had they stood still and just watched, which is what the enemy has taught us, and we believe it, and unfortunately I have preached it, just stand still, just stand still, just stand still and watch God work. They'd have stayed on that side of the Red Sea, and they'd have died and been defeated at the hands of an enemy. It is a myth. It is a myth. That God wants you to stand still. God said, get moving. Don't stand still. Get moving. Go from the place that you are to the place that I'm calling you to go. Now here's what I want you to do. You go and you study scripture. After, after God told them, no, 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 don't stand still. Get moving. Why, why are you crying? Why are you complaining? I'm telling you to go over here. And when they moved, when, after, you understand that, right? After they moved, you know what happened? Miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. God protected them. God provided for them. God defeated the enemy once they moved. Now what do you think? Let's just be realistic here for a second. What do you think would have happened had they stood still? There was nothing separating Pharaoh and his big bad army from God's people had they stood still 
I love you enough to tell you the truth. And you know what's going on? A lot of people, a lot of Christians are standing still. And we're taking it from the enemy. And we're taking it from the enemy. And we're taking it from the enemy. In the name of I'm doing what God said. God never, ever, ever said to stand still. Man said that. And Moses was a great man. But unfortunately at this point he caved. Because people are complaining. By the way, I don't have time to go into this. When he sent the spies, you know what God commanded Moses to do? You go find out if this is a good land. That's what God commanded Moses to do. But then you know what Moses told the people? He said, you go see if this is a good land and figure out about the people. The land was good. What God commanded was good. But then Moses added some stuff there. And he said, now you go tell me about the people. And now the people are giants and we can't overtake them. And we're like grasshoppers in their sight. You see, when we overstep what God is telling us to do in our life, we always get ourselves in trouble. Listen to me. Quit standing still. God's telling you to move. And when you do, when you move, when you go to that place that God's telling you to go, God performed miracles for them. God protected them. God provided for them. You see, it wasn't until they got to the other side that the enemy was defeated. It wasn't until they got to the other side that God provided for them manna from heaven. It wasn't until they got to the other side that God brought water from a rock. It wasn't until they got to the other side that they walked into the promise that God had for them. You see, if you stand still, you're going to miss all of those things. And right now the enemy wants you to believe, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I've been taught that since I was this tall. Just stand still and watch the salvation of the Lord. Just stand still. That's a myth. Based on scripture. This is not my opinion. My opinion does not matter, by the way. I'm sharing with you, Moses said, stand still. God said, get moving. This is a myth, and we need to bust that myth. Myth number three. Myth number three. I have no part to play in being spiritually victorious. I have no part to play in being spiritually victorious. God will do it all. And you know what? That is mostly, I mean mostly that is true. But, but where it becomes a myth is when we think that I have no control over it. And here's what the enemy wants us to believe, and this is a myth. If God wants you to be victorious, if God wants you to, to overcome this thing that you're facing in your life, then God's just going to let you overcome it. But there's really nothing that I can do about that, and I'm just kind of at the... Mm -mm. No, that's not true. That's a myth. I have no control in this thing. It is what it is. And unfortunately, it ties right back into the second myth. Then we just stand still, and we watch society take the hearts and the minds of our kids. We watch society come in and bust up marriages. We watch society come in and, and to rob the voice of followers of Jesus Christ because we're standing still and we're doing nothing and we're saying nothing. We're pulling out of having an influence in our society and we don't have an influence in the education system. We don't have an influence politically. We don't feel like you should have an influence in the business world. And the truth is this, if God's people don't have a voice, if they don't have an influence, we can have no impact on the world in which we live. And then we just start thinking, well, it's just what it is and there's nothing I can do about that. I have no part to play in being spiritually victorious. I want to share with you some scripture. I'm going to be in Joshua chapter 23. Joshua chapter 23. I'm going to go ahead and read to you verses 1 through 13. And then I want to just break this down for you. But Joshua chapter 23, starting in verse 1, says this. The years passed and the Lord had given the people of Israel rest from all their enemies. Joshua, who was now very old called together all the elders, leaders, judges, judges, and officers of Israel. He said to them, I am now a very old man. You've been, you have seen everything the Lord your God has done for you during my lifetime. The Lord your God has fought for you against your enemies. I have allotted to you as your homeland 
all the land of the nations yet unconquered, as well as the land of those we have already conquered from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. This land will be yours for the Lord your God himself, for the Lord your God will himself drive out all the people living there now. You will take possession of their land just as the Lord your God promised you. I want to stop right there for just a second and, and just build on, on what's going on here. It says in verse 1 that the Lord had given Israel rest. You see, at this point, they had been over, they had been across not just the Red Sea, but they had crossed the Jordan. They had been to the place. They had already been fighting, and they had fought for years and years. And now God had given them rest. I want you to get this. They had been through all that battle. They had been through that turmoil. And now they're to the point that God is giving them rest. And he says in verse 2, he says, Now I'm very old. He's telling them I'm getting ready to pass away. And he, he brings out to them that you've seen everything the Lord has done for you. God has been faithful. You've seen him provide. You have seen him protect. You have seen him giving us these lands. But he says something unique here in verse 4. I have allotted to you as your homeland all the land of the nations yet unconquered Joshua is getting ready to die this is at the end of his life this is at the end of his ministry and God's people the Israelites have been at rest and here's 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 something that we got to be careful of because when there's no turmoil when there's no chaos we get to the place that we're at rest right and we can just stand still and here's what God's telling them it's not over it's not over. Just because you've got a victory in this area does not mean the fight is over. It does not mean that you can take the rest of this time off. I mean, I want to refer to something back in Ephesians chapter 6. When God tells you to put on, put on the armor of God. In Greek, they use the Greek imperative form of that word. And what that means is that you put it on and you keep it on. If you think you can put on the armor of God on a Sunday and take it off on Friday and Saturday, the enemy's going to tear your hind end up. The armor of God is supposed to go on you and to stay on you. Even when things are smooth, even when things are good, you are to put on the armor of God and you are to keep on the armor of God. And you see, here the Israelites had been fighting and they were successful and they started to rest in that success. And then Joshua said, listen, there's some lands that I'm going to allot to you and even broke down who you're going to beat and who you're going to defeat. But they're yet unconquered. Follow Christ, listen to me. There are things that God wants to entrust to you. There might be ministries. There might be uh, people that you're going to be able to witness to and to influence that God wants to entrust to you and you've not done that yet. If you and I take it off, if we just take it off spiritually, and say, well, I'm at peace now. We finally got through this rough patch and we've done this and we've done that. And we just start to stand back and do nothing. You're not going to be able to claim the unconquered land that God desires to give you. He goes on in verse 5 to say, the land will. Say will. The land will be yours, which means it's not now, correct? Is that what that means? It will be yours, but it's not now. For the Lord... Your God himself will drive them out. Here's what I'll tell you. I promise you, God will do his part. God will do his part. He is faithful. Amen? Have you witnessed, have you experienced God being faithful in your life? He will do his part. And he goes on to say that you will take possession in the future. But he says something here in verse 6. And this is where we get to where we're going to bust this myth. In verse 6 he says... So be very careful to follow everything Moses wrote in the book of, book of instruction. Do not deviate from it. God will do his part. Amen. But he's saying here for the Israelites, for God's people, to do most of what was in the instructions. He says you need to follow everything, everything that's written in Moses' book of instruction, which is the law. 
Here's what God wants you to understand. He has given us a book of instructions. Amen? He tells you how to fight. He tells you who your enemy is. He tells you what the enemy's plan is. He tells you how to do marriage. He tells you how to parent. He tells you how to do finances. He tells you how to, what type of an employee to be at work. He tells you how to deal with jerks. He tells you all these different things in the, in the Bible. He even tells you how to make the enemy run from you like a fugitive. You see, he's given you all these instructions and you need to obey everything, not part of everything, everything that's written in his book of instruction. Now there's a verse of scripture in verse 10 that I absolutely love, love, love this verse. And, and if, you, if you need it encouraged today, this is a verse that'll do it. Verse number 10 says, each one, say one, each one of you will put to flight a thousand of the enemy for the Lord your God fights for you. I love that verse of scripture. I want to take it and shove it up the enemy's nose and to let him know that when God fights for me, that one of us who is a follower of Jesus Christ can take a thousand demons and devils and put them back to hell where they belong. One of you will chase a thousand, not because you're good, not because you're smart, not because you're talented, but one of you can defeat a thousand enemies of the devil by just knowing that God fights for you. That is an exciting thing. The enemy wants you to think that, well, he's all powerful. No, God is fighting for you. And he says that to flight. But then he goes on. So we have here options. And this is how we're going to bust this myth because if you follow if, 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 if you follow everything in God's book of instruction, then one of you can chase a thousand. Oh, I like that part. Mm -hmm. I'm ready to kick some butt, right? I mean, we're mm -hmm. flesh and blood is not your enemy, okay? Let me remind you of that. For those of you that had a person pop in your head like, uh-huh, uh-uh, that is not your enemy, all right? But let me go on. Verse number 12, but, uh-oh. But if you turn away from him, let me just skip to 13, then know for certain, if you turn away from him, if you don't follow the instructions, verse number 13, then know for certain that the Lord your God will no longer drive them out. I want you to listen to me very, very, very carefully. For those of you who have bought into this myth that there's nothing that I can do. If God wants me to be victorious in this, I'm just going to be victorious in this. That I just need to stand still and watch the salvation of the Lord. If that is your mindset, we need to bust that myth because here's what God is saying. If you don't do your part, God will not. He will not drive them out. He's not going to fight on your behalf. He even goes on to say this. These, this is to the Israelites, by the way, to God's people. And here's what he tells them. Then know for, sure, know for certain the Lord will no longer drive them out. Instead, they will be a snare and a trap to you. So these people that if I fight God's way, that just one of us, one of you can chase a thousand if we do it God's way. But if we don't, not only are you not going to chase them out, not only is God not going to fight for you, but it says that you are going to be trapped by the enemy. We've already talked about that, right? Don't make me back up. Shake your head, yeah. Even if it's not true, ask forgiveness and shake your head, yeah, even if you don't remember. Okay. And then it says, they will be a snare and a trap to you, a whip for your backs. What is that referencing? Who got whipped on their backs? Huh? Jesus, yeah, but I mean during this time. Slaves. Understand this picture here. Understand what God's telling them through Joshua. If you do everything that God tells you, one of you is going to chase a thousand because God fights for you. This is going to be fantastic. But if you don't, I'm promising you, God's not going to fight for you. You're going to fall into their traps. They're going to whip your backs. That means you're going to be a slave again. And then he goes, here, he goes on here to say, that they'll have thorny brambles in your eyes. 
what's he talking about there? That doesn't make any sense. If you don't fight God's way, there's things. If you get brambles and thorns in your eyes, you're not going to be able to see things that are right in front of you. And if you don't fight God's way, and if you don't follow everything in his book of instructions, which is the word of God, which is our Bible, you're not going to be able to see God's promises. You're not going to be able to see God's blessings. You're not going to be able to see the enemy coming because you have not done this God's way. And then the enemy is going to have you blinded, these thorns in your eyes, to where you can't see the goodness that God has in front of you and you can't see the attacks of the enemies. It's a powerful thing. You have a lot of control in this. And then it even goes on to say, and you will vanish from this good land. Not only... Uh, I want you to understand this. Not only are they not going to get the land that's not conquered yet that God's going to give them if they do it the right way, but if you don't do this God's way, if you don't follow everything written in the book of instructions and you fight with human weapons and you have human mindsets and we don't love others and we don't use truth and we don't take our shield which is faith and our helmet which is salvation if we don't do this thing God's way then here's what's going to happen not only are you not going to get the things that God has promised you over here but you're going to vanish you're going to get kicked out of what you already have you see this is a myth that I have no part to play in being spiritually victorious. God is telling you. He will do his part. I promise you God will do his part. But you have to. You have to do your part. Which is basically following the instructions that God has given us in his word. I, I want to I wrap this up by sharing with you a verse of scripture. It's in Philippians chapter 2. It's in Philippians chapter 2. Verse 1 says this. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? I want you to listen to me. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any? Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? As we face the things that we face as we battle the battles that we're battling and as we have to deal with some of the things that we're dealing with as far as sickness and uncertainty politically and, and financially and all these different things, we need a place that we can go to where there is hope. We need a place that we can go to where there is comfort. And this verse says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? And if that doesn't excite you, let me just back on down or go on down to verse 10 of that verse. And verse 10 says that the name of Jesus Christ, that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee will bow. Verse 11 says that at the name of Jesus, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every angel in heaven is going to say Jesus is Lord. Every demon in hell is going to say that Jesus is Lord. Every person on earth, whether they're saved or whether they're not, are going to stand before God and to get on their knees and to proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm talking about a name that's above every name. A name that is powerful. A name that there is healing and anointing. Here, let me back up. When you understand verses 9, 10, and 11, that at the name of Jesus every knee is going to bow, that at the name of Jesus, Jesus every tongue is going to confess. Let me back up to verse 1 because it gets ridiculously exciting. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Is there any comfort? You, you know people that name drop? Y'all know any people that they name drop? You know that one person that's somewhat well known or whatever and we're dropping that name right oh yeah I know so and so me and him taught you met him one time had a three minute conversation and now you're like whatever did I do that wrong no you don't know either right okay do you realize if you've said yes to Jesus Christ who your heavenly father is do you realize who died to have a relationship with you? Is there any encouragement at all in the midst of this battle from belonging to Jesus Christ? Is there any comfort? Is there any fellowship, it goes on to say in verse 1. Here's what I would say to you as we 
wrap up and conclude Battle Plan 2020. There is a fight. Amen. Can we just admit it? Man, we're in it. We're in the fight. It's physical. It's financial. It's relational. It's spiritual. We're in a battle. You have an enemy. People and things are against you. They want to hurt you spiritually. But there's a name above every name that fights for you. And when we do this God's way, one of you, just one of you, put a thousand enemies to flight. We can do this thing God's way and have things that at this point are still unconquered. But we cannot do this God's way and He guarantees you that you're going to be a slave you're not going to see the goodness of God. You're not going to see the attacks coming. And you're going to lose the things that God has already entrusted to you. I'm going to ask you to stand. If you feel as if you need to respond today, then I'm going to encourage you to do that.
I thank you for the truth that you give us in your word. God, I thank you for loving us enough to correct us when we need to be corrected. And Lord, I thank you that if we do things your way, that you will fight for us. I pray that you would help us in the midst of all of the battles that we're facing this year. That God, we would recognize our enemy. I pray you open the eyes of your people to understand that this is a spiritual attack. And God, help us to be prepared to put on your armor, to take up your weapons, and to fight your way. And God, I thank you for the promise that you give us that when we battle your way, that we will be victorious. So God, I thank you for the, for the lands that are yet un, unconquered. I thank you for the things that you have placed before us, that the promises that are coming, that for the miracles that you're going to do, for the protection that you're going to give us. Father, I thank you for your faithfulness. I pray for your strength and for your guidance for all of us as your people to know how to do this and to do it your way so that we can be standing firm at the end of the battle. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.